All right, 2 Kings chapter 24, we're um, almost done with the book of 2 Kings. We've got one more chapter left, and that's it, and that's the, the end of, of the record of the, of the kings. And then, of course, you start into the Chronicles, which pretty much is just parallel passages with what we have in First and Second Kings. And um, so we're, we're pretty much wrapping things up, so to speak, with what's happening in the kingdom. Um, the most exciting thing to have happened is already over with Josiah being the king. He was the last righteous king of, um, of Judah. We see now his children are, are taking the throne, but most of them aren't reigning for very long periods of time, and they're all doing wickedly in the eyes of the Lord. And um, we see here basically their captivity takes place in this chapter and um, where Babylon comes against them, the, the Chaldees come against them and take them captive. And um, they still have kings set up because these lands still need to be ruled. So when, these, when you have these great empires and they come in and conquer, you know, and then there's a surrender or whatever, you know, people are either completely destroyed or if they're just submitted or put into obeisance over the, underneath the, the, the empire, they will leave, you know, oftentimes, and we see this happening too, they change leadership a little bit. They put someone else in place. They take, you know, okay, this guy is coming with us, but we're going to put, we're still leave a ruler in charge here. And that's what they do. And they need to keep order. They need to keep the land under control, but they're going to put someone in there who's going to, you know, kick back the, the, the bounty or whatever and be in submission unto the leadership, which we saw that even in the last chapter. We saw that... Um, which, which king was that? Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim gave the silver and the gold to Pharaoh. So that was prior to the Babylonian Empire coming in. This was when, you know, Josiah picked the fight with Egypt and lost. That's how he died. And then his, you know, Egypt then still apparently fought with them. And Jehoahaz reigned and he only reigned three months. And um, then... Jehoiakim was put into place and he gave the silver and the gold to uh, Egypt because they had the, the dominion over them because they were conquered by them, basically. And he taxed the land for it and then they, they kept paying tribute to Egypt. But then, since then, you, have, you had Egypt, but then Egypt, we're going to see in this chapter, they don't, uh, they're, not, they're not powerful anymore because Babylon comes and essentially just destroys all the nations and conquers all the nations and they become this worldwide empire. But let's, keep let's start reading here in verse number one. The Bible says, In his days Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up and Jehoiakim became his servant three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. So this is now when, when Nebuchadnezzar becomes the king of Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar is the one who goes forth and just conquers for the Babylonian Empire and kind of creates this big empire. Remember, in Daniel, this is the same Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, who, who gets full of himself, right? And God has to bring him low because he's like, look at this great empire and all this great work that I've done because he was the ruler. He was the one going forth and conquering and to conquer, as it were, right? Like we're going to see again with the, when the first seals open, with the Antichrist going forth, conquering and to conquer, riding on that white horse. Well, that's what the original Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, did with the Babylonian Empire. He went forth conquering and to conquer, and, and he ended up conquering the, the, the known world at that time. He ended up conquering and becoming this worldwide empire. And, uh, and he got lifted up and got to bring him down and all that, that whole story. But in chapter 24, we see in his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up. Jehoiakim became his servant for three years. So... When, when he came up, Jehoiakim submitted to him. He says, okay, we'll be your servants. You know, we're, we're going to allow you to reign. And then he rebelled. Verse 2, and the Lord sent against him bands. And look at this. The Lord sent against him bands of the Chaldees, right? He rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar, and then God ended up, ends up punishing him. And now we know God's, it's not just because he rebelled that God's bringing this punishment. God's bringing a punishment and judgment upon them because of what Manasseh did. 
because of all the innocent blood that was shed, because of everything that happened previously in the land of Judah. But let's see what happens. It says, and the Lord sent against him bands of the Chaldees. The Chaldees or the Chaldeans are the Babel, part of the Babylonians. They're the Babylonian Empire, so they might not be part of Babel proper, but the Chaldeans is that same area, the same region where Babylon is. Uh, the Chaldeans, so he sent against him bands of the Chaldees and bands of the Syrians and bands of the Moabites and bands of the children of Ammon and sent them against Judah to destroy it according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servants, the prophets. Now keep your place here. Turn, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 9. We're going to be spending um, not, not that much, not any time in Second Chronicles like we normally do when we go back and forth, but we are going to be spending time in Jeremiah. So keep a bookmarker when we're done here. I'm only going to look at a couple verses in Jeremiah chapter 9 right now, but we're going to go back and forth. So keep your place in Jeremiah because the events of Jeremiah, the preaching of Jeremiah, what's recorded in Jeremiah takes place from the time of Josiah forward until the captivity, the full, complete captivity. So we got Josiah through Jehoiakim, through Jehoiakim, through you know, these kings that were put in place until they're just completely wiped out no more. And, and that's in Jeremiah, you know, Jeremiah's there when, when everyone's taken captive and then they let him stay in the land and then they rebel and then, you know, and, and all this stuff is happening and stuff that we're reading right here in this chapter. So we're going to be looking at some of the preaching of Jeremiah to get an idea of where the people were at this time, what's going on, and get a different perspective of the kingdom. Now, when we read in the book of the kings, what's most important, what we, what, what's focused on is the king, right? How the king ruled, some of the things and the actions of, of what the king did. And we saw how Josiah was a great king. He, he, was a, he did all kinds of great things, but what we're going to find out as you read Jeremiah, and just read the whole book. I was, I, this week I've been reading a lot of Jeremiah and uh, just trying to get my mind in there. And it's great when you, re, when you start to put together all the, um, the different preachers and when they preach, when they, what, what time frame they're in, because a lot of this is, is, is happening at the same time. Um, it gives you a different perspective and understanding of what's going on in the nation. The things that Jeremiah is preaching about you know, he's preaching, because when Jeremiah preaches, it's, it's to the people as a whole, not necessarily specifically to a king, right? And King Josiah was doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not all the people did. We'll get into that in a little bit, and actually the people didn't. And, 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 and typically that's the way it is. You know, a, a, a leader is great. A leader can do a lot. A leader can have some sway with God, and we know that God postponed his judgment against the people because of Josiah, because of, because of him specifically. But we also can see the hard-heartedness and the stiff-neckedness of the people, even in jo Josiah's day, that they didn't fully turn their heart to follow the Lord the way that Josiah turned his heart to follow the Lord. And leaders are very important. We need good leaders. We need strong leaders. We need people who are going to stand up and just, and just promote the word of God. But God's judgment was, you know, a leader isn't necessarily going to, going to save everybody, right? The, the heart of the people needs to, to soften up and turn to the Lord as a whole. One, one good leader, man, that's great. And, you know, they could, they could be motivational and help for sure. And we want more good leaders and leaders are very important, but you know, ultimately the people need to be, as a whole, as a group, need to be turning back to God. And if they don't, then there's still going to be problems. Uh, look at verse number 25, Jeremiah chapter 9, just at the last two verses there in, in chapter 9. Remember, what, I'll reread what we read in 2 Kings 24. So it says, And the Lord sent against him bands of the Chaldees and the bands of the Syrians and bands of the Moabites and bands of the children of Ammon against and sent them against Judah to destroy it according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servants, the prophets. So the prophets have been warning. The prophets have been prophesying. One of those prophets is Jeremiah. Jeremiah 9, verse number 25, the Bible says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will punish all them which are circumcised with the uncircumcised. Egypt and Judah and Edom and the children of Ammon and Moab 
and all that are in the utmost corners that dwell in the wilderness. For all these nations are uncircumcised, and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in the heart. God's judgment is coming. And look at, he, he mentioned specifically the, the people that came against the children of Israel, children of Ammon, Moab, the Chaldees, and the Syrians. Who does he mention here in verse 26? He mentions, uh, I mean, there's a few others here, Egypt and Edom, but he says Ammon and Moab, right? And um, I believe this is part of that prophesying against Israel. And he says, you know what? These other nations, they're heathen nations. They're uncircumcised. But Israel is uncircumcised in the heart because they're not turning to God. They have a hard heart. And that's what God cares the most about anyways, right? The circumcision is just a sign. It was just a symbol. But what it's supposed to represent is their heart being circumcised, their heart being opened up to God, their heart being softened and receptive to God's word. But Israel received that punishment. And you could look at, this is just one small example. You read through the book of Jeremiah and you could see a lot of warnings. Read through some of the other prophets and you could see warnings that were coming even prior to this event. So, there's a few prophets that were prophesying, I believe, specifically kind of during this time, which was, and, it's, and it's spelled out during this time. But there's many of the other prophets were just before this, during the times of Hezekiah and Jehoshaphat and, you know, and Joram, these, these various kings that we already went through. There was lots of prophets during those times too. And, and I didn't really dig in very much into those prophets during the preaching through that. But... Um, Check it out for yourself. Look, go through a, a good way to know for the vast majority of like the minor prophets. Just start reading the very first few verses and it'll tell you when, not for every single one of them, but for the most of them, when they were preaching. And that helps you to kind of put it all together and you see, oh wow, th this was all happening and these, this was all being said during this reign and during this time period. So um, it really will help you to get the full picture of things that were happening within the Bible when you do that and kind of put them side by side and make sure you know when, uh, when events are taking place. Um, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel are, are still all books that are happening. And most of the minor prophets then too are, are for the most part in order, like chronologically still, um, um, as you read through. So um, you keep that in mind too. It's a little bit of, a little bit of wisdom for, for studying your Bible out. Flip back if you go to 2 Kings 24. I just, I just wanted to point out those couple verses about the same people being mentioned and that judgment is coming upon the children of Israel according to the word of the Lord. Just the way God said it, here comes a judgment. This is exactly what was prophesied, is exactly what was warned against, and here it comes, it happens. Verse number three here in 2 Kings 24. Surely, surely at the commandment of the Lord came this upon Judah to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh according to all that he did. So there's no doubt about this. The author here in 2 Kings 24 is saying, surely at the commandment of the Lord this came. This happened because God commanded it. No doubt about it. There's been enough prophecy to just show like, yeah, there's absolutely zero doubt God brought this on the children of Israel because it happened exactly the way that the prophets said it would happen. For the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he did, and also for the innocent blood that he shed. For he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, which the Lord would not pardon. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and all that he did, are they not written in the books of the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? Now, that's why I, I've brought this up before, so I'm not going to spend much time on it. But the innocent blood that shed, God does not pardon. And God does not change. He doesn't feel any different about the blood of innocent children being slaughtered. He gets just as angry and wrathful at that happening today as he ever did. God cares about those souls and about those people who are helpless and defenseless. And they're getting, sla and they're getting slaughtered today it, for decades. They've been being slaughtered in the womb. Defenseless children, innocent blood being shed. God cannot pardon that. Judgment is coming. My right, judgment is coming on our wicked nation. Yes, I said it. The United States of America is a wicked nation. Any nation that allows for abomination of children being slaughtered in their most defenseless state inside of a womb where they ought to be protected 
and endorses that and says, yeah, that's just fine, is a wicked nation and deserves all the hellfire and brimstone that God could pour out of heaven. God doesn't change. And this is going to happen. Just as sure as we see God's judgment coming against these other wicked nations, even his own people. You say, oh, but it's a Christian nation. Yeah, well, you know what? Judah was a nation of the Lord, God's chosen people, and look what he did to them. Look what he did when they allowed themselves to, to devolve into such filth and abominable things and allowed for, for innocent lives to be, to be lost and blood to be shed. It's going to happen. He cannot pardon that type of wickedness. Verse number six, let's keep reading here. So Jehoiakim slept with his fathers, and Jehoiakim, his son, reigned in his stead, and the king of Egypt came not again any more out of his land, for the king of Babylon had taken from the river of Egypt under the river Euphrates all that pertained to the king of Egypt. So now we're seeing little bits and pieces here. The king of Babylon is conquering. He's, he's taken over. So Egypt did have Jehoiakim in under tribute, if you remember that. And he was, he was there taxing the land. And then the king of Babylon came and they were, you know, okay, well, we'll give tribute to you too. But then when they, when they, um, when Babylon took over Egypt, when they conquered Egypt, well, obviously there's no reason to pay Egypt anything because they're not coming. They're already subdued. They're already not in good condition. But then, um, so, you know, and then, and then you got Babylon coming against them and they rebelled against Babylon, but even that didn't last long. So, we have Jehoiakim's reign. Egypt is out of the picture. Verse number eight, Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months. So here's a very short, very short-lived reign. And his mother's name was Nehushta, the daughter of Elnathan of Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all his father had done. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city, and his servants did besiege it. And Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, went out to the king of Babylon, he and his mother and his servants and his princes and his officers. And the king of Babylon took him in the eighth year of his reign. And he carried out thence all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord as the Lord had said. And he carried away all Jerusalem and all the princes, and all the mighty men of valor, even 10,000 captives, and all the craftsmen and smiths, none remained, save the poorest sort of the people of the land. Now, keep your place here and turn, if you would, to Daniel chapter number 1. Daniel chapter number 1. The events of Daniel take place during this time. Because we do, what we just read there, Babylon, the children of Israel rebel against Babylon. Babylon comes and besieges the city. That means they surround the city. And they, they try to choke it out. And basically it causes a big famine. And, and what they do, it's a waiting game. So instead of going in and having a real bloody battle and try to, you know, especially with cities that are fortified, they've got walls built up, right? You're going to have a lot of casualties, a lot of loss if you go in with military trying to take over the city. Right? It's a lot easier to defend the city and you're not going to lose nearly as many people as they will coming in, charging, trying to, to break down the walls or whatever. They're going to lose tons and tons of people in a battle like that. I mean, you could still maybe, you know, de defeat a city and, and finally, you know, get in and conquer it. But what makes a lot more sense is for them to get their whole army together and say, okay, we're going to camp out here. Because within the city, there's, there's not very much land that's used for agriculture, for food, right? All the land is, is out on farms outside of the city where, where people go and do your, you know. Well, guess what? You're not going to get any of that food brought into the city when it's surrounded by an enemy. They're not going to allow for that to happen. It's a lot easier for them to just control every, all the in and out of the city and the people on the inside, they just sit there and wait. And... Basically, if you have a good supply line for the, because the enemy needs food and resources and stuff like that too, right? In order to camp out and to stay there, 
with all their military that they need supplies coming in. So they besiege the city. And what happens then is that the people start starving. They have to ration all their food. There's nothing to eat. There's, a, you know, until they give, until they give up and say, okay, we're all going to die if we just continue, you know, staying here. We can't go out and fight them because, the, you know, the, the, the battle would, uh, there's way too many people out there. You know, if they were to go out of the city and try to fight them and stuff. So eventually, after they're besieged for long enough and their supplies dry up and run out, that's when they give up and, and say, okay, we'll, you know, we'll be your servants. We surrender. And that's what happened here. So they besieged the city. And our, you're in Daniel 1. Stay there. And when Jehoiakim reigned, he's only 18 years old. He only reigned for three months. So three months into his reign, he says, we're giving up. That's it. We've had enough. Now, I want to make a note here because it says, as we're going through, and, and, and mind you, when, when you read through Scripture, there's a, there's a natural order to things, and it's generally chronological, but there's also statements that are made that, that don't necessarily fit if you were to insert them a little bit earlier. So, for example, when it says, at that time the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem and the city was besieged, it gives us, Jehoiakim, the end of his reign, beginning of Jehoiakim, and then it just makes a statement that at that time. Now, I think that at that time is pretty loose because the siege started when, they, when Jehoiakim rebelled. It didn't start with Jehoiakim's reign, his son, and the siege didn't last for only three months. Nobody's going to give up after only three months of being besieged. You have way more supplies than three months worth of supplies in the city. I mean, these, they, they had to be. They had to be independent. They knew that there was, there was, you know, concerns and worries about being besieged, about all this stuff, and enemies coming against them with everything happening to Egypt and Egypt being defeated and them rebelling against Babylon. They didn't only have three months of supplies. There's no way. There's no way. And then they're just going to give up. The siege started earlier on. And you can see this in Daniel chapter 1, in verse number 1, the Bible says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of, Judah, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. Why did he come in the third year of the reign of, of Jehoiakim? Because, if you remember, it said in, uh, in verse 1 of 2 Kings 24, in his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up and Jehoiakim became his servant three years and then he turned and rebelled against him. He rebelled after three years. So after three years, guess what happened? Nebuchadnezzar came up and besieged the city. Right? It makes perfect sense. And the reason why I'm pointing all this out is because I don't want you to be upset or, or, or worried because it doesn't mention in 2 in in Kings 24 that the city was besieged until Jehoiakim became king because it just says, at that time. The servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem at that time. What? The time we're covering Jehoiakim and Jehoiakim up to this point in the record. And he just says, at that time. The general time of what was just covered here. Not the specific time of Jehoiakim coming into power for three months. That doesn't even make any sense. And it's not some contradiction. It's not some error. Not some problem with the Bible. But let's read here in Daniel 1 just a little bit more. Verse number two, the Bible says, And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge, understanding science and such as that ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So this is the events in Daniel. And you could just you know, keep that in mind, put that in the back of your mind for later when you're studying out your Bible, that all this stuff happens during this reign of Jehoiakim, which is right before their captivity. They get brought in. And what they do, what the king does, is he wants the best of the land. He wants the best people. 
he wants to make sure, one, he, he takes you know, the warriors out because he doesn't want there to be any uprisings, any problems when, you know, of, of getting the spoil of the city. He wants them under his control, which makes perfect sense. And, and if they're removed from their homeland and brought right into the heart of their, of their empire, they're not going to cause problems in there. They're going to be subdued way easier with no hope of rebellion that close to this, to this great empire. And they're going to be put to work. So he takes the children and he finds these smart kids, the kids that, that maybe have more advantage, that, that, are, that are maybe wealthier and, and whatever, right? They, they've, they have um, intelligence, they're smart, they're, they're going to be useful in his kingdom and takes all them away. And basically he leaves the poor of the land because someone still needs to be vine dressers and, and do the agriculture and just kind of keep things going in the land and people who he's not going to be worried about causing any insurrections or any problems. And that's what he does. Um, flip back, if you would, to 2 Kings chapter number 24. So that's why I had to point out, because so, Daniel's another book that happens right during this time. Um, verse number 15, And he carried away Jehoiakim to Babylon, and the king's mother, and the king's wives, and his officers, and the mighty of the land. Those carried he into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon, and all the men of might, even 7,000, and craftsmen and smiths, a 1,000, all that were strong and apt for war, even them, the king of Babylon brought captive to Babylon. So you see there are people who were strong for war, you know, um, the people who are craftsmen, smiths, right? All these, all these skilled people he's bringing into the city and say, okay, you're going to come work for me now. Um, verse 17, And the king of Babylon made Madaniah his father's brother king in his stead and changed his name to Zedekiah. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that Jehoiakim had done. For through the anger of the Lord it came to pass in Jerusalem and Judah, until he had cast them out from his presence, that Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. So Babylon came in. The siege was so bad that only three months into Jehoiakim's reign, he's like, we're ending this. Jehoiakim had held out for a long time. We'll have to see again how, how long was his reign, like 11 years or something. Um, Jehoiakim, verse, in chapter 23, yeah, he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. So 11 years. He started, the siege started in his third year. So it was eight years of a siege going on of them just holding out and holding out and holding out and holding out, right? And Jehoiakim, I mean, after eight years, he was 18. When he began, he, so since he was 10 years old, he's been living under conditions of being under siege. And he is just like, we've had enough of this. We're giving up. We can't, we can't win this. So that's what he did. And then what happens? The next king that's, that's put in play. I mean, and, and, and the people of war, right? All the best of the land now is gone. And what happens? Zedekiah rebels against Babylon again. He doesn't submit. Why though? Why does he, why does he rebel against a king? Verse 20 there in 2 Kings 24. For through the anger of the Lord it came to pass in Jerusalem and Judah until he had cast him from his presence that Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. God wanted it to happen that way. God knew it was going to happen that way. God, God in a way, made things to happen that way because he wants his judgment to come through because they, they still hadn't suffered enough for, for the innocent blood that was shed, for the sins of Manasseh, for everything, you know, for all the idolatry and everything else that went on. They were not done yet. So that's why. Because you're thinking like, how are you going to rebel? Like, like, you're just looking for another beating? I mean, do you, do you, are you glutton for punishment? You just, you just want to get beat down that bad? Like, there's no way you could win. Why in the world would you rebel? For what purpose? The purpose is from the Lord. That's why. Just like we saw with, um, I believe, just like we saw with, with Pharaoh when Moses was trying to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt and he would not let them go. Why? Because God hardened his heart. And God made sure it happened then that way that 
And, you know, reprobate Pharaoh just, just wasn't even able to, to let him go because God wanted to make his might known in the world and bring uh, his people out with a strong arm. So in, in, in like manner, God made it here to where he's going to bring his judgment using other nations, using Babylon, upon the children of Judah and Israel because they deserved it from everything that they did. Um, now I want to, because that's it for, for 2 Kings 24. It's a shorter chapter. You know, there's not a whole lot of action necessarily going on here. But turn, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 3. Jeremiah, I believe Habakkuk, because Habakkuk talks about the, the Chaldeans coming and judging Israel and stuff like that, and Zephaniah all were preaching during the days of Josiah or this time, this time, this real close time frame. Those are the three specifically that I could point to and say, yep, these are going on during this time. And um, the warnings are all similar. And that's one of the things, because I was reading through a lot of these. I've, I've been studying for these last few chapters and stuff. And um, a lot of the warnings are very, very similar. And it's, it's interesting. You, re, you put them side by side and you read, what did this prophet say? This one, this one, all preaching at the same time. So, I mean, how cool is that too? Think about that. It, just in, the, in, in Judah, you've got people like Jeremiah, you've got Zephaniah, you've got, you know, you've got these men of God. The whole, almost the whole country is, is, is wicked and turning their back on God, right? Enough so that they need to be judged. But you still got all these really great on fire men of God just standing up and preaching the word of the Lord. That's cool. I mean, it's, it's neat. You just kind of think about like, man, what if I was alive during that time? You'd be listening to Jeremiah. And you think, and, and see, this is, this is what we have to remember too. Man, oh man, hearing the, pre the preaching of Jeremiah, I mean, directly just the word of God being preached to these people. How do they not repent? How do they not come to the Lord? But they didn't. You can hear great preaching today. You can hear people and say, how do people not get it? They didn't get it in Jeremiah's day. Now, I'm not saying that, that I or any, you know, anyone I know necessarily is as good of a preacher as Jeremiah was, but you could still hear a lot of really good things. I mean, just, just great truths being told. And it's like, how do people not, how does this not sink in? Well, they didn't, it didn't sink in in Jeremiah's day. And I think, and, and what's sad about that is, is if it's not sinking in with people today, that's an indicator of where the nation is as to where their nation is. Because people are people. It doesn't matter if they're Jews and, and we're Gentiles. You know, when the... Uh, the, um, when the... When the nation of Israel was, was broken off of the tree... And we were grafted, the Gentiles were grafted in. He says, you know what? You could be, you could be broken off too. They could be grafted back in or whatever, you know. And, and if you're not bringing forth fruit, you're going to be, you know, it's going to be the, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given unto another nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. So we're not immune from being broken off, as it were. But what we see, when we see the way people respond, it, it's, gonna, it's indicative of, of, wow, this is what was happening during these times too. Uh, so we see a lot of that. The warnings are similar. The most obvious between all of these prophets that you see is the, is the judgment coming for idolatry. They all reference idolatry and then, you know, whoring after other gods and worshiping stocks and stones and the, you know, the works of men's hands, stuff like that. That's, that's probably the most obvious that's very similar between the prophets. Um, but it's also interesting to see that even though Josiah was a great king, the people still were wicked and did not turn to the Lord with their heart like Josiah did. Uh, I mean, Jeremiah chapter 3, look at verse number 6. The Bible says, The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. And I said, after she had done all these things, Turn thou unto me. But she returned not, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Now, I'm going to pause right here. We're going to read a few more verses, but we don't know exactly when during the time of Josiah 
these words are being preached or spoken because we know that Josiah wanted to serve God and that's when he started, you know, repairing the house of the Lord and there's many years that went by and they found, they found the book and then he's like, oh man, we've been doing things wrong and then he got on fire and then he really started cleaning up the land and going into Israel and cleaning up there and stuff too. So this might have been before he really got into all of the areas and stuff, maybe a little bit, because that was a little bit later during his reign. This might be a little bit earlier on. But the, the point still remains. The point is still valid because he says, have you seen what backsliding Israel has done, right? The northern nation. Have you seen what they've done? They're gone up on every high mountain, under every green tree. Then they're playing the harlot, meaning they're worshiping all these false gods. Do you see what she's doing? Do you see what Israel's doing? Going out and worshiping all these gods? Verse 7, and I said, after she had done all these things, turn now unto me. So God is still using his prophets to preach unto them because he's not audibly speaking from heaven, turn now unto me. No, he's using his preachers. He's using his prophets to go and warn and say, look, turn back to God. He still wants to have you. While they're out whoring around with other gods, he's sending preachers to him saying, turn back to God, repent. Get right with him. Get rid of all these stupid gods. God wants your heart back to him. Turn down to me, but she returned not. They didn't listen. And her treacherous sister, Judah, saw it. Judah saw what was going on with Israel. And what happened to Israel? They were taken captive by the Assyrians. They got judgment come upon them because they didn't listen. And Judah's watching all this stuff happen and didn't do any... And, and, it didn't affect them. Look at verse number eight. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. He said, they saw me divorce Israel and let her go into captivity and bring judgment upon them. And what'd they do? They took no heed they did not take heed to what was happening to Israel to get right themselves, but they went and played the harlot too. And you know, we ought to, in our life, as well as in the examples in the Bible, be able to take heed to the things that have happened when people do not, are not right with God and when people turn their back on God or when people start going after lust of the flesh and building up their own idols and they get judged. Hey, think about it and let it sink in. When judgment from God comes that's very serious against people, we ought to have a fear of the Lord and not just say, well, I'm going to go off and do the same thing. I'm going to go off and do exactly what they were doing, even though I just saw what happened to them. Even though I saw this person who just got wrapped up in a fornication or wrapped into drugs and alcohol or whatever, completely destroy their life because God's judgment came down upon them. Well, I'm just going to go off and do the same thing. Watch out for that. And watch out for all the examples we have in Scripture, too. Don't, don't be like treacherous Judah who saw what happened to Israel and didn't, didn't fear, didn't let that sink in. Look at verse number 9. And it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. Again, referring to idolatry. Stone, stocks, is just referring to graven images. Uh, verse number 10. And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but feignedly, saith the Lord. So feignedly means like faking it, like they're putting on a show, like, like they're saying it with their mouth, but they're not believing it in their heart. And I believe that this is very indicative and telling of what was going on during Josiah's time. Because Josiah made a covenant between him and God and between the people and God that they're going to do what's right. And, and Josiah did turn to the Lord with his heart. But when it seemed like, when we were reading in the Kings, that the people followed too, they didn't really in their heart. Because had they really turned to God with all their heart, who knows what might have happened. I mean, there still would have been judgment, but they probably wouldn't, it probably wouldn't have been as severe as it, as it was. Because they just feignedly turned to the Lord. They would say things. Why? Because Josiah said it or whatever, but they didn't really wholeheartedly embrace it and embrace the Lord. They just gave lip service to God. God wants more than you saying, oh yeah, I believe the Bible, or coming to church, but then 
not living the way that, that the Bible commands us to live, right? And not embracing the word of the Lord with your whole heart. It's just kind of a fake or a show. God has no respect unto that at all. And the little bit that you might be doing is going to go nowhere. Stay in Jeremiah. I'm going to read for you from Zephaniah chapter 3. Turn, if you would, to chapter 14 in Jeremiah chapter 14. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse number 2, the Bible reads, She obeyed not the voice, she received not correction, she trusted not in the Lord, she drew not near to her God. Her princes within her are roaring lions, her judges are evening wolves, they gnaw not the bones till the morrow. Her prophets are light and treacherous persons, her priests have polluted the sanctuary, they have done violence to the law. The just Lord is in the midst thereof. He will not do iniquity. Every morning doth he bring his judgment to light. He faileth not, but the unjust knoweth no shame. This was, again, I'm going to, I'm going to, I didn't, ha I don't have this in my notes. I want to just make sure I am completely clear. Because this is all, all, I'm pretty sure all of Zephaniah's preaching is against Judah and Jerusalem. And it definitely says that in chapter 1. And um, I pulled this. Verse number 1 says, Woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressing city. And again, these are all judgments coming against Judah and Jerusalem. And what I found interesting, the reason why I, brought, I bring up these verses here in Zephaniah because this is also during that time, is what is happening in the lands. He says, She trusted not in the Lord. She drew not near to her God, which we already know. We've heard this before. Her princes within her are roaring lions. So the people in charge, the rulers, are roaring lions. I mean, they're, they're devouring people, right? They're wicked people, wicked rulers. Her judges are evening wolves. So there's, there's no judgment. There's no justice happening within the city because everybody's wicked. You have spiritual wickedness in high places. You've got the rulers, you've got the judges. It says they gnaw not the bones till the morn, till, till tomorrow. We're talking about being wolves. Um, verse four, her prophets are light and treacherous persons. They're light. They, they, they care about vain things. That's what being light means, that they're, they're, they're not deep, they're not, they're not sober, they're light. They, they don't treat anything seriously and they're treacherous right? They're like wolves. They're sneaky. They're doing wrong to people. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. They have no respect for God's law. It's all vanity. This is what's happening in the land at this time. This is what Zephaniah is preaching to Judah and Jerusalem. Woe, woe to the bloody city. The just Lord is in the midst thereof. He will not do iniquity every morning doth he bring his judgment to light. He faileth not, but the unjust knoweth no shame. There's no shame for these, these wicked doers and how bad the state of affairs within Judah and Jerusalem. We see this perspective from Zephaniah. Jeremiah chapter 14, again, we're going to see something very similar. Verse number 10, Thus saith the Lord unto this people, Thus have they loved to wander. They have not refrained their feet. Therefore the Lord doth not accept them, he will now remember their iniquity and visit their sins. Then said the Lord unto me, pray not for this people for their good. And this is an important note to make. He's saying, don't pray for these people for their good. There gets a point in a nation and a group of people that God says, don't even pray for them. And people today might go, oh, I thought we we're supposed to pray for everybody. God bless America. God bless everyone. God bless the world. No. When people get this, we can say, don't even pray for them. Don't pray for their good. They need judgment. They need God's wrath pouring down on them. That's what needs to happen. That's what's right. And if you are going to be praying for their good, you're going against God, against the will of the Lord. See, when we pray for people, we ought to pray that the will of the Lord be done. And when we pray for people that are in trouble, like I've, I've mentioned this about a week ago, you know, we ultimately, we want God's will to be done. If God is bringing judgment upon people, if they need it, then they need it. 
Now, if we don't know any, because re- there's a lot of things we don't know, right? So God could be judging people and we have no idea why, you know, and God understands that too and we're, you know, when we're praying. But I mean, that's why he specifically told Jeremiah that don't pray for these people for their good. You know, and when people get themselves in a mess, we don't pray for their good. We pray maybe if they need to uh, be humbled or see the light or things like that, that they can see those things, that their eye could be opened up, that they could see the errors or the ways or whatever. But we don't pray for things necessary to get better for people when you know what's going on and when, you, when it's pretty obvious that it's the judgment of the Lord. Um, there's definitely people we don't pray for their good. But this is, what, this, is, this is what's happening. Again, during this era, during this time period, Jeremiah 14, 12, when they fast, I will not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offering and an oblation, I will not accept them, but I will consume them by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. Basically, God's saying, my judgment is against them. It doesn't matter if they're offering sacrifices, if they're fasting. I'm not going to hear them. I've had enough. I'm done with them. They're reprobate to me. And my judgment is coming upon them. And people like that, he says, don't pray for this people for their good. Verse 13, then said I, ah, Lord God, behold, the prophets say unto them, you shall not see the sword, neither shall you have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. Then the Lord said unto me, the prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination and a thing of naught and the deceit of their heart. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that prophesy in my name, and I sent them not. Yet they say, sword and famine shall not be in this land. By sword and famine shall those prophets be consumed. And the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword. And they shall have none to bury them, them, their wives, nor their sons, nor their daughters, for I will pour their wickedness upon them. There are going to be the false prophets. And again, this lines up with Zephaniah. It lines up with other portions of Scripture. We see what's going on in the land. We see that there's wicked rulers. We see that there's wicked judges. We see that there's wicked prophets that are telling the people, nothing bad's going to happen to you. You're not in sin. God loves you. And you know what these preachers? They're preaching in the name of the Lord. And these are the preachers. They're not preaching in the name of Baal. These are preachers that are preaching in the name of the Lord because they're saying that the Lord said unto me. He said, you know what? I didn't send them. Those prophets are prophesying lies. That's what Jeremiah said. Well, what about these prophets? They're all saying that, that nothing bad's going to happen. God said, I didn't send them. And you know what's going to happen? The judgment's still going to come. And he says, those very people who are saying the sword's not going to come, the famine's not going to come, he says, they're going to die specifically by exactly what I just said is going to happen. They're not getting away from this at all. They will go down. And the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword. False prophets aren't the only ones affected by, you know, by them being a false prophet. So the people that, that listen to them too and subscribe to that, you know, people today, everyone's responsible for getting their heart right with God. There's a lot of false prophets out there that are going to tell you, oh, everything's good, everything's great, God bless America, aren't we so wonderful of a nation, we're so Christian, blah, 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 blah. No bad can ever happen to us because God's on our side. And, and they're, all, they're out there in abundance, especially these prosperity preachers. I just saw something on Facebook recently. It was uh, Kenneth Copeland, right? That, that wicked, false prophet, devil, Kenneth Copeland, and his deceitful ways, and I, I still don't understand how people can't see this, but there's a lot of people that buy into it. And he just had, just some video was put up with some other guy, some dude with long hair, with dread, some white guy with, dread, with dreadlocks. What's his name? Is it Tom White or something? I, I, don't, I, don't know his, I don't know his name because I don't know this guy. But it's like, this guy's, I mean, he's like effeminate. I say, oh yeah, and he's, and he's basically saying whatever Kenneth Cope is saying, like, like practically bowing down to the guy. And... He's supposedly, I guess he's some pastor or preacher, but he's got like this really long hair. It's like, try reading the Bible. Then they're standing there in their video, they got their Bibles open and stuff, and they're trying to tell everyone why they need to give all this money. You know, 
Oh, we're going to read a scripture and it says, oh, you, yeah, give, give, yeah, give, there's blessing. And, and Ken and Colvin's talking about this bank account and heaven and how you can withdraw from your bank account, like here on earth or something. Like, nothing that they were saying made any sense, but what they're, what, it's funny, it, it, it's not funny, actually, it's, it's, it's subtle. You see the subtlety and they, they speak just enough about things to get thoughts in people's minds without even actually saying it. And what they do, without actually stating the words themselves, they get people to think that if I give a lot of money to them, God will give me a lot of money. And they didn't say those actual words, but they plant the thought in your head by saying things the way they say them of just, oh yeah, and, and yeah, we know the Bible says to, you know, to lay up treasures in heaven, but you know, did you know that God also said, that you can have a bank account, that you, you basically, you've got a bank account and you could, you know, put, put in and take out from it and everything, you know, and it's like all these blessings. Look, they're out there. And those phony false prophets, judgment's coming against them. You, you believe it. But the people that buy into it, that are listening to them, you know what? Judgment's going to come on them too. They need to wake up. People need to wake up. These preachers that prophesy in the name of the Lord. Oh, and that, that was the other thing they said. He said, Jesus told you to start this work, didn't he? Jesus, yeah, he said, yep, Jesus told me. Yeah, Jesus literally, yeah. Okay, where is that in the, are we going to add, you know, uh, First Copeland chapter one, Jesus told me. Watch out for people that say, Jesus told me to do something. If the words that they're saying Jesus told them to do aren't found in this book right here. If you say Jesus told me to preach the gospel to every creature, you could say amen. Because he did. That's what he said. That's, that, that's a message for all of us today. But if you say Jesus told me to go out and start a college where I can teach people stuff and he told me that he wants you to, to give as much as you can to this ministry because we need this help and we... This is a phony, fake liar. Jesus didn't tell you that. They make such a big deal of all this money and all this stuff, and it's like Jesus made Judas the treasurer. He put Judas in charge of the money. Do you think God cares that much about money? Nope. God owns the, you know, the cattle on a thousand hills. God, God owns everything. It's his creation. He made it all. It all belongs to him. He doesn't need your money. God can make anything happen without any money. And if, for, and if there's something he wants done that uses money, you know what? It's, it's not a problem for him to get it. These phony charlatans. There was a lot of this going on in, in the kingdom of Judah. We see the, 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 the heroes, the great people, right? Like, oh man, this is awesome. How could these people? But you know what? There's only a few of them, ultimately. I mean, we read a few of them. But there was a lot of these false prophets. And that's the way things are today. There's a lot of these phonies out there. Uh, last place, Jeremiah 15, verse number one. Jeremiah 15, verse one. Then said the Lord unto me, though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my mind could not be toward this people. Cast them out of my sight and let them go forth. This is how seriously bad things were. I mean, think about, think about Moses standing before the Lord we just, I just preached on this recently where, where, you know, God was ready to start all over with Moses and destroy all the children of Israel when they were coming out of Egypt, when they had made the golden calf, when they had set up their idols, right? Moses stood before God and God changed his mind and he didn't wipe them all out. But in this situation... God says, even if, even, if, even if my friend Moses was going to try to intercede for this people and Samuel, Samuel, I mean, two great men of God, two humble men of God, people who love God, he said, if they were standing before me right now, yet my mind could not be toward this people. Cast them out of my sight. That's the attitude that God had. I mean, it's that, that's, that's when you know, I mean, things are really, really bad. When, when not even Moses can, can, 
you know, intercede and change God's mind. Verse number two, and it shall come to pass if they say unto thee, whither shall we go forth? Then thou shalt tell them, thus saith the Lord, such as are for death to death, and such as are for the sword to the sword, and such as are for the famine to the famine, and such as are for the captivity to captivity. And I will point over them four kinds, saith the Lord, the sword to slay, and the dogs to tear, and the fowls of the heaven, and the beasts of the earth to devour and destroy. And I will cause them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for that which he did in Jerusalem. The judgment is coming. The judgment's here. We see the preaching. Read more. Read Jeremiah, especially the first like 20 chapters is all up until Zedekiah. And we just see Zedekiah here at the end of 2 Kings 24. We see Zedekiah being put into, into reign. So those first 20, 20 chapters are all like during the reign of Josiah. And I, there's so much more I could have added, but obviously, I mean, this isn't the scope of the sermon tonight. I, I just wanted to add some of this stuff in there to, to help give you the state of affairs, especially during the time of Josiah and why all these things are happening and why it had to happen. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for, uh, for your words. God, I pray that you please just, just give us greater understanding and knowledge and wisdom from your words. God, help us to just, to just put everything in order here and we can have a, a more full comprehension and understanding of your words. Uh, God, we love you. We ask for instruction. We want to be able to learn from other people's mistakes, especially in the Bible, dear Lord. Help us have a healthy fear of you and that we would not fall into the same traps that other people do, but that we, could, um, we can just stay in our service to you, dear Lord. And uh, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.